welcome to the conversation on Sky Sport where we've been taking a special look this week at the state of the game, women's rugby in the build up to the historic Super Rugby women's match between the Blues and the Chiefs. Eden Park, Saturday, 4.35 kickoff, and we've talked to administrators, we've talked to a couple of our Sky commentators, so now we need to hear from the players, from the Blues, the skipper Eloise Blackwell is with us, and from the Chiefs, Chelsea Alley, joining us, which looks like her bedroom, but that's okay, as bed's looking good, nice and made welcome in to both of you. How exciting is this? I'm pumped and I'm not playing this game. Yeah, super excited. Can't wait to take the field. And what about for you, Chelsea? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, we were at Black Ferns Camp just last week and the banter flying around was, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. Um, not just between the Blues and Chiefs players, but um, even the girls from all the other regions are, are pretty excited. Um, a few are flying up from Christchurch and Wellington to come and watch the game. So... It's pretty wicked just how it's taken off like it has. Have you guys been um, sort of vying for the love of your other Black Ferns teammates to support either the Chiefs or the Blues in this game, asking the, the Cantabs and the Wellington players and, and all of that? Have you been, have you been bribing them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as Chelsea said, like lots of the girls from the other regions have been really getting behind us. And um, I wouldn't really say bribing, but, um, you know, I have definitely been asking them the question, who are they backing? And, you know, the... I reckon the, the favour is definitely um, in the Chiefs, but you know you definitely can't count out the the, bl the Blues. <laughs> is that because nobody likes Auckland? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's probably the, the reason for it. But uh... <laughs> so for you, Eloise, I mean, do you feel like Blues and Chiefs players like putting that on? We've obviously got the jerseys here behind us, like to to feel part of that that franchise and that club. Yeah, it's a pretty special feeling and. Um, myself growing up um, within the Blues region, always watching it um, as a young person and uh, now to be given the opportunity to pull that jersey on, like it, it's, it's super special and you know we've got lots of young girls in the team and I guess they probably, well they may be well aware of um, I guess the magnitude of it but yeah it, it's so huge for us and it's yeah, it's going to be awesome. Because you're, wa you're Waikato Hara, you're born and bred, <laughs> Tokoroa, you're, you're Chiefs Mana, right? <laughs> Forever. So, so to, to be able to pull on a, a Chiefs jersey, what is that going to mean to you? Yeah, look, I, I grew up watching the Chiefs. Um, I, I've backed them every season they've played, basically, no matter how they've um, kind of performed on the leaderboard. But, yeah, for me, um, I remember the first training getting given a, a Chiefs training kit to play in. And I, I honestly thought that um, in my time playing in my career, the opportunity wouldn't come until a lot longer down the track um, for us to play in the Super Rugby team. So it has always been a dream of mine, but for it to actually come true, like uh, it's pretty surreal. Um, it's been awesome. We've had the backing of um, the Chiefs uh, franchise from all the boys who play for the Chiefs as well. Uh, they've come along and support us at training. So, yeah, definitely feeling like... Um, a welcome member of the Chiefs whānau, which is pretty cool. I like that, just making sure she hasn't jumped on the bandwagon <laughs> while, while the men's team have been going good, right? Like, making, <laughs> making sure everybody everybody knows that Chelsea Elliott is definitely Chiefs mana through and through. And, but, and that's a good point <laughs> she makes, Eloise, in, in that you guys have both been at the, at the coalface of this game for a, a long time. What is the actual recognition um, to be able to do this, to make this history again? What does that recognition mean? Oh, I think it's huge for our game, and... I guess um, we've really, or personally, I've noticed a real shift in um, in the following of women's rugby in New Zealand um, post that Barbarians tour we had last year, and um, I think it's huge for the game. It's it's huge for the youth and the up and coming players to see that there are these pathways. And as Charles said, like I had never imagined or ever thought of uh, this opportunity coming around, and it, it's really huge, even for us. You know, we've, we're seasoned campaigners, have been in this environment a long time, and. Um, you know, just the excitement to, um, I guess, to be given this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, words can't even really describe it. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could actually see like both of you like fully beaming just at, the, at what it's going <laughs> to mean. It's, it's like a, it must be hard to get that across sometimes, Chelsea, that how, how, how hard some yeah, of you have had to fight for this. For us, it's still exciting to even have a Farah Palmer Cup match televised. You know, so making making interest and getting the country excited about a woman's rugby team is massive. Um, and I just think about in you know ten years time down the track when all these young girls who are playing club rugby now um, are able to wear Chiefs jerseys and Blues jerseys and 
hopefully be more kind of full-time contracted players within these franchises. And for me and Ella, I guess it's it's going to be pretty cool to sit back in 10 years' time when we're in wheelchairs with broken bodies and, <laughs> and see these young get the, get these opportunities um, because of us kind of pushing for it, I guess, and during this um, really important time in, in women's rugby in New Zealand, um, to be a part of that and to keep kind of pushing to make sure we're getting these opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the role down the track as well. Yeah, do you guys actually get a say in what's happening in the game aside from the work you do on the field you both got jobs as well but do you actually get a say not necessarily at the board table but within your unions and and to new zealand rugby i know you guys have got someone like kate sexton who's head of women's development and is a go-to for many of you but do you, do you get to bang your head against the brick wall as i've said <laughs> to everybody else in this and say what you want to see happen oh i'm unsure if we're allowed to share, are we? Um, there's a working group. Um, you can now. We can, yeah. We, yeah, there's a working group. Um, it's going to be rolling out the next couple of weeks with different players from each of the franchises to help, um, I guess, shape how it could look going forward. Awesome. And I guess, yeah, we're, we're the test dummies. And, um, you know, we hope to put on a, a spectacle, in the words of um, Chelsea Alley, um, to make sure that, you know, we... Um, we do it justice because there's so many um, awesome women playing this game and you know we, we need to do that to help continue the growth of it. Because this can't just be a one-off, right? No. Yep. For me, I, I, um, I guess I'm kind of outspoken in that I make sure I'm on the different chats and, and get amongst kind of what's happening. I like to know the ins and outs and how things are going to happen. So. Yeah, like Alice said, we're going to get the get the working groups up and running, and um, definitely make sure that um, women around the country get a voice and and make sure that this is going to be uh, something that not only rolls out just for this year, but becomes a mainstay in New Zealand rugby. Mm. So, as I said, you both got jobs. You both teachers. Um, can you see a time where we will have full time contracted players? And, and would you want to do that? Do you still like having the the, the the, the job on the side, it must be a massive juggle. Yeah, like personally, I, I enjoy the, the balance of both um, my teacher life as well as um, being a rugby player. I guess it, it gives me, I don't know, six hours of the day to, to switch off from um, training and um, just to do what I love, which is being in front of um, kids and helping um, grow their skill set. So uh, I can definitely see in the near future that it's going to look to be professional. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've had a few conversations the last couple of weeks about if I was a full-time rugby player, I feel like I'd get bored. And I wouldn't know what to do with my time. Like It'd be cool for the first couple of months, but yeah, I might have to relocate back home and um, get more time on the water and in the bush. But yeah, I, I quite enjoy the balance and, um, you know, it just, yeah, it, it's good for now. Mm. Charles? Yeah, it's a tough one. I guess um, everyone's... Every single individual athlete's in a different position at the moment. You've got some who are still in school, some mm. coming out and studying, some in full-time jobs, some doing shift work. So when we first like go fully professional, I guess there's going to be a few, um, I guess, teething issues with with it because it is such a massive thing. And, and as I said, everyone's going to be different and respond differently. But I think it's where it needs to go. Um, if you look at women's rugby around the world and the level that everyone's getting to, um, there's already some countries that have professional clubs and stuff. So um, if we want to continue to be the best team in the world, um, I think professional's the way it's going to go. And unlike Ella, um, I won't find myself too bored. I, I like cafe hopping and hanging out with my nieces and stuff. So, um, yeah. We'll be all good. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it's a good point that you made though too that it can't just be, you know, it's something Honey Hedda Me Smiler brought up that um, it can't just be a transplant of the men's game. There are probably more things in the well being and a more holistic approach that's needed for, for women with, you know, families and, and things like that to, to commit to. Do you, is that something that you guys feed back as well that you, do things do need to be slightly different? Yeah, and I guess that's kind of been the, I guess, the juggling act for these last um, couple of years yeah. since the Black Ferns moved into the semi-professional -prof realm. Um, you know, we do have mothers in the team and who also work full-time jobs, so... Um, and then you've got players who 
have focused on their career first and then have come back into the game. So it's definitely a juggling act and I think or I'm pretty aware that that those are the things that are going to be discussed and you know as Chelsea said it's going to be a teething period but um, yeah 100% agree with her that's the way it has to go because you know we can't keep um, doing what we're doing without having the I guess the resources and behind us to compete at that on the world stage. Could you either of you though could you have ever imagined I mean Chelsea you were the first I think rugby development officer women's development officer at a, at a um, provincial union that when you started yeah. out that this would be where you had got to that we're even having this conversation like oh yeah we might have full-time contracts in the next however long yeah it's pretty exciting um and i think it comes down to the the players before us the trailblazers that um you know fought to wear the black jersey and fought for um women to be a bit more recognized and stuff and um although me and ella have both been around the team for a while and we're just reaping the awards kind of at the end of our career um, once again, it's for those young ones coming through, like to to have young family members and stuff, and tell them uh, young women, sorry, and tell them that they could actually make a career out of rugby. Um, that's something that you wouldn't have thought of five to ten years ago. So, um, a really important thing that, well, a really positive thing that we'll take when we first go, maybe go professional, hopefully in a few years, is. Um, the men have done it. They did it back in the early 90s and we can kind of um, have a look at what went well and what didn't go so well for them and hopefully do it better for mm. the women. Well, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly it'll be done better for, for the women by, uh, by um, the women. You talk, you've talk, both talked about some of the young players. Talk about young talent. Um, does it blow your mind, some of these youngs? Are you going to have Patricia Maliapo on your side? We've chatted about her in this series. Um, what is she? She hasn't quite made it to 18 yet. Um, a world at her feet. Yeah. Well, she had her 18th birthday oh, probably did. a month ago now. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it does blow your mind, the talent that's coming through and, and the opportunities that these girls have now um, to develop their craft. You know, we've got, especially up in Auckland, um, We've got a uh, high-performance group of girls who are, you know, at the end of their high school careers, but then also um, rolling out first year out of high school. And, you know, those girls just, um, I guess they're like sponges. They want to learn, they want to absorb everything they can. And, and for us old girls or uh, experienced players, yes. um, I guess it's Watch like it. a... <laughs> Me, myself. Um, it's, it's a breath of fresh air, you know. Like I've got little Maya Roos, who's um, my locking buddy, and no, oh, she's, a, she's, she, a, oh, she's yeah. just as big as yeah. me. Um, you know, she's always picking my brains about things, and, and that's what we want as um, experienced players: is that these young ones coming through, they want to learn because we've got so much knowledge to, to give back to them. And I guess if we can help, um, you know, share what we know and help guide them through their careers um, from an earlier age because there's just so much more support now. Like, who knows what they're going to be doing, uh, you know, five years' time. It's going to be pretty crazy where they're going to be at. Do, do we have to be a little bit careful in that like, so the pace of change has been slow and now we're like, come on, let's get things moving, but that these young ones are going to come into a completely different environment than professional contracts, much more scrutiny, social media and all of that, and, and how um, that they're cared for and, and looked after as they come through Chelsea? Yeah, definitely. That's something we're all aware of. Like, I think back when I was a first year out of high school, if I was in a Chiefs team and then all of a sudden in a Black Ferns where I'm professional and stuff, I think about would my life have been the same? Would I have done as much in my career as I even got my degree and all mm. of that sort of thing? And I think that's the balance that we need to find. Like, we need to still um, be allowing these and encouraging these girls to build their life out of rugby as well. And that's what I think in the, that's happened a little bit in the men's game. When they go professional too early, they don't have, they feel the pressures and they don't have the opportunities to um, make sure they're sorted for life after rugby. Um, and that's something in the Black Ferns environment that um, I think our PDs and our coaching group and management group are, are pretty aware of. And they're pretty good at um, making sure that girls have other um, career opportunities and things as well. So, yeah, it's, it's really, really exciting, but I think it, it is up to us older ones and, and um, those higher up to ensure that um, these girls are still on track with other things as well. Because I guess that's something you would see coming through schools, right? 
Yeah, definitely. And as Charles said, there just needs to be so much more support around these young girls, um, you know, because rugby doesn't last forever. You know, you might want to start a family or, you know, uh, you could get a career-ending injury. So, you know, you need to have a backup plan. And that's something that I try and instill in my um, my schoolgirls that I coach. You know, like rugby is the vehicle that, that helps um, create all these opportunities for you, but you do need um, something to fall back on as well. Obviously, this year has been a, already been a roller coaster for you guys with the with the World Cup announcement, um, which must have come as a shock. Yet at the same time, possibly wasn't a, a total shock. How have you been able to absorb that, reset your mind, and think right? I can. I've got another year to get through to that World Cup. How, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, I guess it was always in the back of my mind that it potentially could be postponed. Um, it took me probably a couple of days just to kind of dwell on it a little bit and feel a little bit upset about it um, and deal with it. But yeah, like the goal's still still the same. It's just the goalpost has shifted through to you know, 16 months from now. Um, you know, I'm still just as um, excited and I'm prepared to, to try and do the best that I can to make sure that I'm pulling a, jersey, a black jersey on come September, or October, November, <laughs> next year. Somewhere next year, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and for you, Charles, and I guess um, it's having an idea that there's going to be a plan in place for you for you this year. Um, sounds like there's a whole lot of stuff maybe happening September, October, Chelsea. Yeah, um, yeah. Like like Alice said, that announcement was tough, but for me, what drives me is is a test match in the black jersey. Like that's kind of what we do everything for to get out there and play. So. Um, I know that NZR and our management group are working really hard to get um, some tests together at the end of the year, and I think that's just hugely important. Um, we haven't played a test in almost two years now, which um, mm. you think about all the hours of training and weekends at camp and everything, um, it's quite tough. Um, but as long as we've got a test date in place coming up at the end of this year, I think as soon as that's, that's fixed and that's a done deal, um, that's just going to increase motivation levels once again. Yeah, cause girls are doing pretty good though. Like, yeah, I was going like to say, oh, another camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goal, goals are, goals um, have been put out a year, but they're still the same. So we're still going to get the best out of um, every every woman in New Zealand that's um, buying for a World Cup spot. Well, it's probably going to make that competition for places even tougher, right? Because some of those younger ones are just going to have another year if they get some test matches under their belt. Actually selecting that squad next year is going to be horrific. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a coach because yeah. some of the positions, just the, I guess, the level and ability of the players that are coming through, yeah, like lock in particular, there's so many good locks coming through and like, that just helps drive me to make sure that I'm staying on top of my game because there's a lot of, a lot of young girls that are pushing for spots and yeah, it's cool, it's, it's good to have competition like that because, you know, being in the team for a long time, um, all the experienced players, you know, you, sometimes you need a little bit of a, a nip at the tail, at the at the heels yeah, yeah. to to keep you um, keep you in check. Yeah. Right, let's have a look at this game. I want to have a look at your squads. So the strength of the Blues and the Chiefs squads for this historic Super Rugby Wahine match, Chelsea. What is the strength of the Chiefs? Um, I think man, we've got we've got talent all over the park, but I think. Um, our Lucy trio is going to be pretty. Um, it's going to be pretty tough for our selectors to even pick our starters and our bench mm. players. There's going to be some great girls that miss out. Um, we, we've got a good. Oh man, we're good everywhere. To be honest, um, we're probably a little bit lighter in the front front row compared to the Blues. Um, if you saw the infographic, actually, I think there were seven front rowers on it. Yeah. So <laughs> we know um, we know where they where they are going to try take us. I think so. Yeah, um, we got we got some nippy backs. Um, yeah, just all over, really. <laughs> I'm just excited. You can uh, rebut or rebut. agree. Definitely, you've definitely got a very strong type five. Yeah, I I agree, Chelsea. Your your tri Lucy trio, but um, <laughs> yeah, you cool. know, I have to back the the Blues Ford pack. You know, as you said, Chelsea, that graphic. You know what was it? There was Eldora, Itunu, Alicia Pearl Nelson, Takura Nataringa Mate, Christo Tofa, oh, Crystal Sha Murray, Crystal Murray, Charmaine McMiniman, you know, like our four pack that 
that has some firepower and we've got a lot we've got some youth coming through, we've got Lisa Molia, um, Liana, I'm sorry I can't say her name properly. Mickey Ellie too. Yep. Liana, she'd be um, back after her, um, her leg broke injury. broke leg, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, Tim and Fib. We've got Maya Roos. Like, man, this is... So where, but where are your points coming from? Where's the Blues points coming from? <laughs> Pick and no, goes, probably. Say, Line out malls. We'll drive, we'll drive from 80 metres out and probably maul all the way up the field with our, our four pack. <laughs> the difference in those four packs, they like... All those players you named, the big, strong, powerful players, whereas our, some of our better players are the likes of like Les Elder and Kennedy Simon, who mm. uh, aren't as big, but mm. they're just completely different types of players. So I think this game is going to be, oh, I think it's going to just have massive momentum switch, switches right through the whole thing. And um, it's going to go right to the 80th minute. And it's going to, I think it's going to come down to who can play their game plan the best, because I can... I can see it now that both teams are going to have quite different game plans based on the personnel on the team. Yeah, what sort of style, without giving away your game plans, can we expect to, to see from the Blues? Uh, you can 100% expect to see, see a bit of razzle. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got quite a composed black, uh, back line led by Hiroa Hei there. But, um, yeah, you can definitely um, expect some razzle. You, you might expect a lot of pick and goes. Um, <laughs> we'll be looking to run it straight up to Chelsea in the middle there and and play from yeah. there. <laughs> I was going to say, you should be expecting to make a lot of tackles in midfield, right? Yeah, yeah, always do. It's all good. <laughs> we'll be coming for it. I mean, that's going to be a key though, Chelsea, is how your your tight five in particular can get some parity to get that, that front football for, for the likes of Hazel to be able to work with. Yeah, um, like Ella mentioned in, in the kind of game plan, there'll be a lot of mauling and pick and go, but We'll, we'll be like um, any good Chiefs team in the past and there'll be a lot of played with a lot of pace and um, moving the ball around a bit. So, as I said, two completely different yeah. types of styles, yeah. I guess. And just before I let you guys go, um, can you imagine, do you start to think what it's going to feel like to run out at Eden Park for the first time knowing you're making history wearing a blues and, and a Chiefs jumper? Yeah, as Charles said, like it, it's pretty surreal. Um, it's awesome to be running out on such a venue such as Eden Park. That's going to be huge. Um, for us, being Blues players, we're going to have our friends and whanau in the crowd, so that's going to add to the um, atmosphere and make it that moment even more special. And to be uh, the first team to pull on that jersey and, and be able to do that, it, it's huge and it's such a privilege. And I really hope that the girls take in the moment, uh, take, up, take in the opportunity and... And yeah, you know, once you pull that jersey on, you've got your superpowers and, and we're ready to go to war against our mates from um, down the bomb base. And for you, Chelsea? Yeah, oh, look, it's going to be an amazing occasion. I, I just can't wait. Um, at the end of the day, it's just a huge milestone for women's rugby. Um, probably bigger than I, I first thought it would be. And... I mean, the, as I said, the banter between Chiefs and Blues have been, has been pretty good, but I think it's pretty special. Um, we do know each other very well. Like, um, Although me and Ella are going to be rivals on the field and we're going to do everything we can to make sure our team wins, I'm, I'm going to be equally as happy for the Blues girls, like Ella and her team, um, for, for getting to be a part of, of this special occasion. And... I'm sure, you know, by the end of the game, we'll be um, hugging and smiling and we'll all just be so proud of what we've achieved. So, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Thank you. Absolutely cannot wait. Chelsea Alley, Eloise Blackwell, Blues and Chiefs. And it is all on Eden Park, Saturday, May 1st, 4.35 kickoff. You absolutely will not want to miss it. It'll be live, of course, on Sky Sport 1 and on Sky Sport Now. So you must catch all the action of this historic occasion. Of course, you can catch up with our episodes of The Conversation wherever you get your podcast as well. But get yourself to Eden Park or tune in and watch the Chiefs and Blues Super Rugby Wahine go at it.